I'm Richard Garassi, president of Wagner College and a political scientist myself, so this subject is near and dear to my heart. I welcome you to the Manzuli boardroom in Foundation Hall. For those of you who are new to Wagner and new to this room, uh, this is where we have our board of trustees meetings. I believe the student government occasionally meets here. We have speakers like the one we have today, other kinds of special events and the like. So. Uh, it's a special room. This building, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Foundation Hall, is a building uh, aimed at seniors. Uh, as you know in the Wagger plan, in the by the time you get to your senior year, we're asking the question, what do you intend to, how would you practice this discipline in a civically responsible way? What would you do with this? Even if you have no intention of going on with this discipline, what do historians do, chemists do, folks in business, and so on and so forth, nurses, educators, physician assistants, and the like. And so we have our, our seniors doing a capstone course in every one of their majors. They do 100 hours of field work, and they do a senior project or thesis as part of that, that semester. And so we wanted to build a building, since most of those students are uh, dressing up and heading out to Merrill Lynch or Credit Suisse or the Metropolitan Opera or a theater in New York or a hospital in Staten Island or a school in Staten Island or some other borough. Uh, since they're sort of transitioning to the next world, the world of the professions or the world of graduate school or medical school or law school, we wanted to have a uh, residence hall that really kind of was the transition belt out. As the freshman program is sort of the transition belt into what it means to be a college student, when you stand back from all the activity, how to write a paper, how to be articulate in the classroom, how to connect your learning across disciplines, how to connect learning by doing field work and the like, uh, the senior program is at the end, and it's this transition belt out of Wagner in a sense. And so these are apartments and suites. They have their own Starbucks in here and so on and so forth. So this building really has it opened uh, two years ago on Martin Luther King Day, right after that day. And so we were very proud of this building. So it's a wonderful room, and I'm happy to welcome you here. This particular program, uh, the Cary Center, uh, is a wonderful, wonderful institute at Wagner which studies government effectiveness and responsive, responsiveness in a nonpartisan fashion. We have speakers across a whole range of activities and orientations and ideologies that come to campus and speak. We're so privileged to have Susan with us today, and uh, Dr. Lachlan will introduce her in just a second. I should just say one last thing about the Cary Center. I don't know if this is the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth speaker we've had. I can't remember. Seymour will put all that in perspective in a second. But the center does a tremendous amount of work with ed uh, editorials that we write, newspapers across the country, and he'll give you the numbers. They're somewhat staggering. Uh, we're trying to make a statement about the fact that government can work. I know that's, that's a big question right now these days, but it can work, and it can work effectively and responsibly. And uh, the institute was set up to do, to essentially um, hone that kind of leadership skill and those kinds of research interests in our students and in the community. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Lachman, who is himself uh, a gift to Wagner. Uh, he was, uh, I think, the youngest person to ever chair the Board of Education in the city of New York, way back when we had a Board of Education. Uh, he's been a state senator. He was a very distinguished dean at the City University of New York and a wonderful professor in his own right. And here he is a distinguished university professor at Wagner, which is the highest rank we have. Uh, and he uh, carries with him uh, the obligation also of managing and, and expanding this wonderful center, the Cary Center, and bringing these wonderful speakers into your orbit. So without further ado, see you in Now, if you take out the kind things that uh, President Garasi said about me, everything he said was exactly correct and right. <laughs> <laughs> I would defer the compliments because I feel that this Cary Institute for Government Reform at Wagner College would never have existed without the continual support of President Richard Garassi in making the dream into a reality, a reality that is known throughout the country. So we have an outstanding president that we know, and we also have an outstanding supporter in the office of the president, who is the president, and I want to thank him very, very much and I'm glad that uh, the first lady of the college, Professor Karen Grassi, was able to make it in this rainstorm today. Okay? Uh, having said that, let me very briefly, before going into introduction of uh, 
Susan Lerner, our uh, guest speaker, uh, mention what has been briefly uh, spoken about by the President. We have, this is our fifth academic year as the Cary Institute, which began as a center. We have published op-ed pieces throughout the nation, from the LA Times, where our guest speaker was living for about uh, 20 years, and uh, to the Wall Street Journal, to Forbes Magazine, to the Miami Herald and the Boston Globe, and not to mention the New York Times and other papers in this nation. And we even made the London Daily Telegraph last month, which is the newspaper of Prime Minister Cameron and of the Conservative Party. And uh, even though I'm a Liberal Democrat, we still made a conservative uh, uh, newspaper. But we have also been able to produce 15 scholarly monographs on different issues. And we hope that today's uh, speaker will uh, be involved in preparing another monograph that deals with her uh, words of wisdom uh, tonight. We have also, in this five-year period, written and published two books, <coughs> Three Men in a Room, uh, which discusses the politics that goes on in the state <coughs> capital. I almost used the word corruption, but I know this is being filmed for us, so I have to be very careful. Thank you, Lee. And the most recent book uh, was um, uh, dealt with the life and the activities of the man who saved New York from bankruptcy, Governor U. L. Carey, in fiscal crisis of 1975, which Governor Andrew Cuomo has sent copies of this book to leading opinion makers and legislators and business leaders and labor leaders throughout the state of New York. Unfortunately, Governor Carey died a few weeks ago at the age of 92. Uh, he was a wonderful person and one of the greatest governors New York has ever had. And I would compare him to Alfred E. Smith, who ran for president in 1928 when he was governor of the state of New York. And at that time, uh, I believe that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was his lieutenant governor. Anyway, having said that about uh, the Institute, and uh, we will continue our activities in all ways with the continued support of the president and, uh, and the faculty and the students at uh, Wagner College. Let me introduce to you uh, our speaker today. Uh, this is our ninth speaker at a forum or lecture in the spring and in the fall. Uh, one of the professors here reminded me that last year we had Clyde Haberman of the New York Times. We've had Tom Swazi, and uh, we've had uh, reformers like E.J. McMahon, who's a conservative Republican, Blair Horner, who is a liberal Democrat. Uh, as President Garassi said, even though we might uh, be for more familiar with one of the political parties than the other, we make no distinction between conservatives and Democrats as long as they are in favor of reforming state government, not only in uh, New York, but Illinois, California, New Jersey, you just name it. So we'll be continuing our work, and we're delighted that Susan Lerner was able to be with us uh, today. She is currently the executive director of one of the uh, most prestigious and most important reform groups in the state of New York, and it's called Common Cause. And uh, she's been in that position about, what, four years, Susan? Three and a half. Three and a half years. And uh, before that, uh, she's basically um, a New Yorker. Uh, I think you were born in uh, mm -hmm. New York, and you have a degree from NYU Law School. You attended the University of Chicago. But she also spended, uh, spent, excuse me, she also uh, spent 20 years in California. I believe it was Los Angeles. Uh, and where she was the executive director of California Clean Money. And I'm sure that involves clean money in politics as well as clean money in one's home. Uh, 
she served as a, steering, uh, a member of the steering committee of the Commonwealth Club's Voices of Reform Project and the Board of Trustees of the California State Summer School for the Arts. Uh, she, for 20 years, this lady was also a trial lawyer in Los Angeles. And uh, as I mentioned, she's a graduate of NYU Law School. And uh, several of our students who are here today, I know are applying for admission to NYU Law School, and they're studying very, very hard <laughs> for that. It gives me a great, uh, with a great deal of pleasure, and it's an honor to introduce to you uh, Susan Lerna, who will be speaking on the topic, Can a Constitutional Convention Reform State Government? Susan? Well, thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you to uh, President uh, Grassi and Mrs. Grassi uh, for being here. Um, and for that, for the kind words. This is, I think, an interesting and provocative topic. Can a constitutional convention reform state government? At the University of Chicago, one of the things they taught us was the most important thing is how you phrase the question. And so I'd like to delve into the question. I'd like to unpack it a little bit and start not with the Constitution, but with our general political um, status here in New York State. Why would we be asking this specific question at this specific time? And I think that if I were to ask all of you here today what your feelings were about state government, then you would have the response that the vast majority of New Yorkers have, which is, it's not working for us. We don't really know what it does, but whatever it does, we know it's not helping us. And when we read about it, we read about things happening in Albany, right? It's the catch-all. <coughs> State government is up there in Albany, and it's a bunch of people unrelated from what we are concerned with in our daily lives. It's not helping, and in fact, if anything, it's hindering. And the vast majority of New Yorkers feel that state government is dysfunctional. And recent events, unfortunately, up until this past legislative session, did nothing to disabuse them of the sense that state government was dysfunctional. If anything, it confirmed that we had really bad problems in Albany, that our legislature wasn't able to really address the state's issues, that fiscal questions, the economy of the state and the state budget were spinning out of control year after year after year where the state budget was late. And all we heard about was that the Democrats and the Republicans in the legislature were back and forth in a horse race, a political horse race, warring with each other, and the concerns of ordinary New Yorkers were not being heard. So the question of can we reform state government, I think, is an extremely relevant one right now because what we are hearing at Common Cause and organizations that is devoted to holding power accountable and advocating for efficient and effective government is people want to see the results of some sort of reform. They want government, if, it's, if we're going to have government, and we are, we need government. It is what we need to maintain a civilization. And there are various reasons why we have to have an effective state government. And indeed, state government is the level that in actuality has a tremendous impact on your life on a daily basis, but it is the area of government that is least well understood. People tend to think about the federal government, people tend to think about the city government, and they don't really understand how much is actually controlled by Albany. But Albany controls a tremendous amount, and not by accident. It comes through our state constitution, a founding document that controls what is or is not controlled by state government. And in New York, we have a document that is very adhesive of power to the state level, very controlling of what happens at the city level, particularly New York City. Um, and so a lot of the reasons why things happen the way they happen 
and what I would argue is a stasis, a static situation in New York politics is due to the current state of our state constitution. So to me, the answer of the question, can a constitutional convention reform state government, we need to ask another question. Can we reform state government at all? And is the constitutional convention the right tool that we can use? Right now, I would posit from everything we're hearing, not only from our members, but from voters and citizens around the state, people want state government to be reformed. It was the key issue when Elliot Spitzer was elected as government with a large majority. It was the key issue in which Andrew Cuomo ran for state, uh, state governor. He was going to clean up Albany. He was going to make it work. He was going to reform it. So how exactly do you do that? And I would suggest to you that we have to reform our state constitution. Because our state constitution over this period of several of centuries, really, has evolved in a way that makes it work for some element of our society. And I would suggest to you the way it has evolved is that it works for what I would call the political class. And it works to entrench incumbents, and it works to ensure that the two-party system, as it's practiced here in New York, and it's practiced differently in every state, and New York has a particular interesting variety of, poli of party politics, our Constitution is currently designed to ensure that party politics continue pretty much the way they are right now. It is working for our political class. It is not working for the rest of us, and that's why we see a disconnect between what's happening in Albany and what the desires are of ordinary citizens and what they would like to see the political process be. So there are different aspects of the Constitution that are designed to ensure that the two political parties maintain control. How we run our elections, contemporary example. We have just had a series, we've just had a number of special elections this past Tuesday. There were five assembly seats which were open. There was one congressional seat. Representative Weiner's seat was open, we know why. Um, and the question was, how are those vacancies going to be filled? Well, there are some basic requirements in the state constitution. Statutes go ahead and fill in the blanks, but the state constitution provides for special elections. What we've seen is that process is one that's very much controlled by the party apparatus, not an open process. And arguably, the way in which to open up special elections to the voters could be done through changing our Constitution. There are various different examples that I could give you of ways in which the Constitution is used to ensure that there's a very limited amount of movement in our state government and a lock politically that the current political parties have on the levers of power. We can argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is in our Constitution. And I would argue that many voters are, in essence, arguing against party control. Because if you look at registration records, you see that the largest growing affiliation of New York voters, and this is not just a phenomenon we see in New York, but we see it across the country, are what we here in New York politically call blanks. So, so you register and you don't fill in the line as a Republican or a Democrat, you leave it blank. In other states it's called the decline to state. That's the largest, fastest growing party affiliation in our state. That is a way in which people who feel that their voices are not being heard are pushing back against a system that they feel is not responsive. A system that was, I would argue, responsive at one point has evolved to a point where it's not responsive to the concerns of the average voter. It's become an incumbent entrenchment system and we have provisions in our constitution to ensure that that's not going to change. So if some of our issues are really, if moving reform forward is impeded 
by things that are in our Constitution, how would we actually get to change our Constitution? So here in New York, we have, we are one of 14 states that has a mandatory referendum that's placed on the ballot every so often that basically asks the voters, do you want to change the Constitution? So let me backtrack a little bit and talk about this particular referendum and how it came about um, historically uh, in America, why we would have so many states. <coughs> it's an artifact, really, of the early 19th century approach. Would there be a mandatory constitutional question here in New York State? It's every 20 years. And I'd like to read to you something that Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1816 because it's an interesting mindset that reminds us about our founding fathers and how we've evolved to a different place. Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1816 that, quote, each generation has a right to choose for itself the form of government it believes most promotive of its own happiness. A solemn opportunity of doing this every 19 or 20 years should be provided by the Constitution. Well, obviously that is not something which was adopted for the federal Constitution. And, and I'd like to point out to you, 1816, that was very close to the end of Thomas Jefferson's life. This was definitely um, the statement of a man who had seen a lot politically who had been one of the founding fathers, who had been a founder of the revolution, and now he was saying, you know, we shouldn't let things get too static. We shouldn't let things be too immobilized. We do need to shake things up periodically. So every 20 years, he suggested. Ultimately, that was adopted in the New York Constitution in 1846 with a requirement that every 20 years the following language should appear on the ballot. Shall there be a convention to revise the Constitution or amend the same? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but very inclusive. And that presents a political challenge to us that I'll be talking about in a moment. That is the language which has to appear. So you can't have a referendum that says, should we change the way in which the legislature conducts its business? Should we change the responsibilities of the governor? No. The referendum language requires the entire Constitution is up for discussion and under discussion at a constitutional convention. One of the oddities of our Constitution, remember I said this was adopted in 1846? The first time this came on the ballot was 1847. And then it comes up every 20 years. What does that mean? That means that this question comes up in an odd year. What doesn't happen in New York elections in an odd year? You don't have the governor running for office. You don't have the president running for office. It's what we politicos call an off-season election. And, I, you know, if I were to ask you here how many of you voted in an off-season election the last time there was an off-season election, I think Unfortunately, you would be representative of the vast majority of Americans, and we would see that maybe 20 to 30 percent of you got to the polls during that time period. So by this accident of timing, when a constitutional referendum appears on the ballot in New York, it appears at a time when most New Yorkers are not going to the polls. They're not paying attention to politics. They're not focused on this. You know from your own experience that we tend to focus on politics, those of us, those who aren't really uh, intimately involved with it, care passionately about it. Most people focus on politics in the week or two before the election, when there's an issue or a candidate that they care about, and that tends to be the larger elections, whether it's the a hotly contested election for the mayor of the city of New York or the president, or if there's a close gubernatorial race. Most of the rest of the time, the vast majority of people does not pay attention. And if we're going to use a constitutional convention to change the Constitution and to bring about reform, one of our challenges is the fact that this question is going to come up on the ballot in 2017. That's the next time it comes up. 
nothing else is going to be of moment. That might be an opportunity if we were able to galvanize enough political will to make this an important issue. But we are at a disadvantage if what we need is a groundswell of public support. Because the public is not going to be tuned in politically. None of the usual things that get people excited about politics will be happening that year. It's not going to be a presidential race. It's not going to be a gubernatorial race. And it's going to be too easy for a small segment of the population to drive this discussion. And that's exactly what happened the last time this issue came up on the ballot, which was 1997. The 1997 referendum is a perfect example of how politics play out. I have to admit to you that my organization was very heavily involved in the issue of whether there should be a constitutional convention in 1997. And my organization was on the no side. And I can tell you the specific factors. There were really two factors which caused Common Cause New York in 1997, along with all of the other good government organizations, the League of Women Voters, NYPIRG, and it's a long list of environmental groups, reproductive health groups, just a very, very long laundry list of what we call NGOs, non-government organizations that opposed a constitutional convention at that time. And there were two primary concerns. The first concern was how the people who would make up the convention would be chosen. It would be here in New York, Constitutional Convention delegates are chosen by election. And the concern was that the statute that sets out the selection process is too easily, I will be blunt and I will be pejorative about it, gamed by the political parties. And so the concern was that if you don't like the way the legislature is conducting its business, how can you, an ordinary member of the public, be sure that the persons who are going to be elected to be delegates to a constitutional convention to rewrite the entire way in which the state government does its business are not exactly the same people who have an approval rating that's in the teens in the legislature? And our law indicates that there's an expectation that many of the same people might be elected. And a big problem politically is the fact that the delegates are to be paid, which I think is a very good idea. But the payment scale is exactly equal to the payment scale of the legislature. And in many instances, in 1967, the last time we had a constitutional convention, a substantial proportion of the delegates were legislators, which meant that they were collecting two salaries, what we call double dipping. That really offended people, but that's built into our law. There is no provision which says if you're already getting a state salary, then you shouldn't get a second state salary because it's advantageous, unfortunately, to the people who make the laws, a problem that we have in getting reform. So that became a big issue in 1997. And guess what? Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more the changes, the more things stay the same. What would be a big issue in 2017? The state of the law is unchanged. Double dipping would be another big issue politically when this referendum comes up. Second large issue for Common Cause and the other NGOs in 1997 is the scope of the convention. There are admirable provisions in our state constitution that go much further or, or further than provisions in the federal constitution that we as New Yorkers are very proud of. We have a state constitution that is very protective of the environment. We have a state constitution that is very protective of those among us who are disadvantaged or poor. We have a state constitution that's very protective of our rights of equality. We have a bill of rights in our state constitution, which is Article One to our state constitution, not an amendment, Article One to our state constitution that people would argue is more protective of our individual liberties than the federal constitution. And there was a great concern 
that if we open up everything, that very popular and useful protections in the Constitution would have to be fought all over again. And as a consequence, many, virtually all of the NGOs, lined up against a constitutional convention in 1997. Now, here's an unfortunate admission about the power of reform groups and NGOs. It is very difficult for nonprofit advocacy organizations to make things happen. But we can stop things. And that's what happened in 1997. All of the groups got together and convinced the public this would be a bad idea. It would be out of control. It would not reform the Constitution. It would turn it into something that would be even less likely to be an improvement. And so the referendum was denied. The referendum, the exact same language, is going to come up in 2017. How much has changed? Unfortunately, the way in which we choose or pay delegates hasn't changed. The language of the referendum is set by the Constitution. It remains, you have to open the entire Pandora's box. You cannot pick and choose. So what will happen in 2017? Well, I absolutely do not have a crystal ball. And I can promise you that I cannot at all estimate what the political lay of the land will be in 2017, but it's pretty interesting to see the discussions that have been going on most recently. This issue of a constitutional convention has come up, and in 2008 and 2009 was being discussed by a significant number of people concerned with the way in which our government functions concerned with politics. Now, you might remember that there was something very singular happening in New York in our state senate in the summer of 2009. And that was what we call the coup, the implosion, where the entire state came basically ground to a halt because of a political battle in the state senate between Democrats and Republicans that kept there from being any state business which was conducted at all. That really fueled the discussion of how can we ensure that we don't have this kind of messy, embarrassing dysfunction in our state government. And there started to be very serious discussions about how do we amend the Constitution to make our legislature more effective, to allow it to work, to have a better balance between our, the branches of our state government. And people began to call for a constitutional convention. It's a topic which is still under discussion. Um, an organization was founded called the New Roosevelt Initiative uh, and the New Roosevelt Foundation, which is involved right now in looking at the whole question of how would you properly put together a uh, state uh, constitutional convention? What would you need? And interestingly enough, in this past legislative session, there was a bill that was introduced. It's pretty interesting. It's S2490, and its title is Relates to a Limited Constitutional Convention to Amend Articles 3, 4, 5, and 8 of the Constitution only. It's a bill that was sponsored by two leading Republicans. Republicans currently are in the majority. Uh, of the state senate. But when people started talking about revising the constitution and the effectiveness and the desirability of a constitutional convention in 2009, for that limited time period, the Republicans were in the minority in the state senate. So the issue of a constitutional convention has transcended <coughs> the change in power. The original response in 2009 when Republicans, including Former New York City Mayor Giuliani brought up the topic of a constitutional convention was, well, this is just sour grapes from the Republicans who are currently out of power and they're looking for some way to revise things so they can go back into power. To their credit, leading Republicans are still talking about how can we have an effective constitutional convention. And they're proposing a limited constitutional convention. Those particular articles are the articles that deal with how the legislature does its business, how the, the governor or the executive is arranged, the judiciary, 
um, officers uh, and civil departments uh, and local finances. The rest of the Constitution would remain unchanged. And I suggest to you that if that were an amendment to the Constitution, because there has to be a constitutional amendment, if that were adopted, and the whole question of having a convention, because it would be limited in scope and it would really go to the question of how does our government actually function, would become much more politically viable. But I fear that unless there are substantial or at least some change in how we choose our delegates for a constitutional convention between now and 2017, that we may see a repeat of the opposition of 1997. What could we do to change the delegate selection process? Well, there are academic suggestions. There's a, a procedure that's called a citizen's assembly that is really, it's a wonderful theory of random selection of, of individual citizens and giving them an opportunity to gather together and educating them on the issues. And it's actually been used effectively in some places. It's um, an idea that was used uh, in Canada in some of their provinces, British Columbia and others. Um, but I don't see it happening, <laughs> practically speaking, here in the United States for something as significant as a state constitution. There's random selection. I don't see Americans going for a lottery that picks. I mean, it's an interesting idea. Actually, I do see that being popular with people. I don't ever see a legislature <laughs> allowing there to be random selection of people who would actually uh, write a constitution. I also don't see there be, being political viability in an appointment process. Right now we have an election. It may be an imperfect election, but I don't see any elected leader suggesting that we should hand pick who would be uh, the delegates to a constitutional convention. So, the, so to the extent that we would reform the process, we'd have to reform the election process. And that we could do by statute. And that's a question of political will. That's a question of our citizens have to be paying some attention to a fairly technical provision. Um, and there would have to be, I think, a strong move among members of the legislature recognizing that if they frame this correctly as a way in which to ensure that they were champions of the people rather than the usual politics as usual, then I think that this actually could be a reform that populist uh, inclined legislators could take up and move forward. And it's one of the things that we hope to see. Uh, an honest discussion about the delegation process and an honest discussion about how to ensure that there's not double dipping and that there is a better and more open selection process. I will be honest with you, that is the most challenging discussion to have successfully in New York State. We have a system which is in all candor, honesty, unfortunately pretty much rigged against an open process. That, but I think we need to start that discussion. I think we need to be talking to our elected representatives. They know how unpopular they are. They hear about it all the time. When they go to the dry cleaners, when they go to the supermarket, when they're back in their districts, they know that being politician is no longer a favored occupation. And we need to be giving them some good ideas how to resurrect the reputation of politicians. This would be a strong statement which would change things enough for the future for them to begin to argue, well, I'm on your side. I'm not just on the side of machine politics. So I would suggest to you that we can reform the Constitution through a convention, but we've got to start the process now. We've got to answer some of these political questions with some good <laughs> suggestions. Um, we've got to, to see if it actually would be possible to limit 
the scope of the Constitution so that so-called special interests, but people who care about a specific area wouldn't be afraid of the Constitutional Convention. And we have to address the question of how do we fairly, how do we choose delegates so that the people believe that the delegates are representing them and not the political parties and not the existing politicians. That's really our challenge. I think we can do it by starting now. I think that it is uh, a big task, but it's got to start somewhere. And if it started here, it would be pretty exciting. Hmm. Thank you, Susan Lerner. Those of you who have never heard of Susan, you might be surprised. I'm not at all. She did in a very short time a very difficult question and issue of constitutional conventions, and she made it understandable to everyone, whether you're a poli-sci major or a chemistry major, or whether you're a full professor or a former educator, that got wet, I think, Professor DeLuca, who uh, has been coming to these events from the very first day, and I knew as a very distinguished educator when I was honored to serve as president of the New York Board of Education. Uh, I see that professor, uh, who is in the audience of chairman of the science department, and one of our newest professors, I think, is sitting in the back, I don't know why, uh, <laughs> Professor Jason Fitzgerald of the education department. And I want to go into a question and answer period. Yes, now, Susan has not a problem of time, but an issue of time, because uh, she's getting the van at 610. So uh, to get it to the ferry, that 620 ferry or 630 ferry, and uh, so, but we do have 15, 20 minutes uh, for a question and answer period. Please introduce your name, not only for posterity, but we know who you are, and uh, it'll be recorded by Mr. Manchester, uh, and perhaps someday televised when you become a state legislator. <laughs> well, better yet, a non-double-dipping member to the next Constitutional Convention in 2017. Uh, I would be remiss at this time if I did not introduce to you someone who is even more responsible than I am for the success of these annual lectures. I say annual because this is part of the Alan Francis Hachman Memorial Lecture. We have another sponsor for the spring lecture. And her name is Alexa Marin, my graduate uh, assistant, who, by the way, uh, who hopes to go to the same law school that Susan graduated from in the near future, NYU Law. Yes. All right, now, uh, without any further ado, questions, just give us your name and then your question, and Susan will respond. And a little bit of, of shameless self-promotion. Um, if these issues are of interest to you, if you're interested in what's going on in New York State and reform <laughs> issues, we have a email list that is only uh, New York centric, um, and so if you are interested, I'm going to pass it around, and we'd be happy to keep you up to date on our attempts to reform the Constitution and the uh, uh, general issues that are of the moment at state government. Now, let me assure you, you do not have to run for public office, or even as a delegate to the next Constitutional Convention, to ask a question. <laughs> uh, I hope that all of you will feel free to ask the question, because Susan Lerner is ready to answer the question. Who is the first one? Hey, introduce uh, yourself. Go ahead. Kevin Farrell, I'm a sophomore. Um, do you, how do you feel like the legislator is going to uh, vote for a bill on reform if they're going to be bringing up a to topic like uh, gerrymandering and redistricting? If it's going to possibly boot them out of office and there's something they're not going to be really in favor of? Well, look, it's always a challenge for any person to vote against how they define their self-interest. Okay. Um, the redistricting issue is very similar to the question of how we choose delegates and how we pay for them. Um, these are questions that are really political. But the truth of the matter is, we have a representative form of government. And what we need to be reminding our elected representatives, that's one of the reasons why organizations like Common Cause exists, is that we elected them to be 
our representatives, not to be representative of their own self-interest or even to be representative of their political parties, right? Because we don't, we have an individual representative system of government. We don't, we don't have the parliamentary system where you vote for the party and the party chooses who represents you. We choose individuals. That's what our election is about. And so part of our responsibility as citizens is to say, we expect you to draw better lines. We expect you to draw district lines in the process that's going to, that started now and that's going to go into the beginning of next year of redrawing the lines. We expect you to draw them to give us a decent chance to elect the person we want, not just re-elect the incumbent. So I think we have a bit of a responsibility uh, in that process. And the truth of the matter is that if any individual legislator feels that their voters, their constituents are going to be angry at them by the way the maps are drawn, that they have a chance of not being reelected, then they're going to be more responsive. So I think we've got to be activated on that, and that's one of the big issues that we're working on. It can be done. We have seen it in other states. We have seen better maps come out of the legislature than the maps we've seen in the last cycle. It can be done, and we do it by saying our definition of your job is you represent us. Thank you, uh, Susan Lerner. Now, the second question is always much easier than the first <laughs> person who asks the question. Uh, We'll get to you, Dom, but first, uh, Karen Garassi has a question. Yeah, I, just as I'm listening to you, I've never really understood this as, a, as a, a problem, and you really explained it quite well. But I'm thinking, in the positive sense, what are the qualities of those delegates that we would want? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and do we have anybody who you know of who might be a good representative. There's always Susan Lerner. All right. I'll even see where we'll act. Yeah. Well, most of the students yeah, well, are faculty I, here. Right. <laughs> well, you know, I think there are actually a lot of very civic-minded people. And most of them feel cut out of the process and frustrated about it. That's why I think we get all of the criticism right now of our legislature. The people feel that they're not being um, I think that a selection process that's fair and that's open, people would step up to it. And I'd like to give you an extraordinary example that comes from California. And it's not about a constitutional convention, but it's about something just about, if anything, as or more wonky than a constitutional convention. And that's the fact that this year, as a result of an initiative that was passed in 2010, California is redrawing its political boundary lines, its redistricting process, with a true citizens commission. And that commission was chosen, was set up by this referendum, and it was chosen through a public application process. And the first step of the process was a website was set up and you had, and if you were interested in being a member of the Citizens Redistricting Commission, you answered some threshold questions to see if you met the qualifications. We were expecting a reasonable response, but as a good government person, I was stunned and thrilled that more than 30,000 Californians <coughs> got on that website and answered the preliminary questions. That many people realized that this was important that it really affected the political, not only the political power, but the day-to-day -day lives of their communities, and they cared enough to engage in the process. So I think if the process were open, many people would step forward. And I think many of them would be, would be more than capable of addressing these issues. And it's one of the things we learned through, actually, the citizen assembly <coughs> process. If you provide people with reasonable information about what the issues are, they will rise to the challenge. People are actually very smart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. President DeLuca. Susan, uh, Tuesday there was a loud explosion in the ninth congressional yes. district. The people spoke and uh, it was a dramatic change. An elected Republican after uh, 90 Democrats years. there since 1920, I believe, 
And as yes. Paul okay, Mayer and Koch said, <laughs> this was a referendum to the President of the United States that he's got to listen and do certain things differently. Now, we can't change too much of that now, but do you think that because of that, there will be any kind of a trickle effect into the New York State legislator to try and understand that people want to be heard, they don't want to be dictated to? Well, I, th I would actually interpret the CD9 story a little bit differently. I think it, there are some national messages, but I think the strongest message is a state and local message. Because the, the entities that were the losers in CD9 were both organized parties. And I think the thing that is most problematic about our politics here in New York State is that two political parties which are not effectively responsive to their larger constituency have a stranglehold on our government system. So you have a candidate who was chosen by the Democratic Party machine feeling that, you know, this is our seat and we don't have to worry about it, so we're going to pick somebody who's safe and will follow orders, and if we decide to do away with his district, he's not going to kick back on it. And a Republican Party, which also read the tea leaves and said it's a Democratic district, um, you know, we're not that interested in a big fight, and somebody came out of right field, um, and not a party operative person at all, and said, no, I have the wherewithal to challenge the Democrats. He's not the first choice of the Republican Party. He's not somebody who's come up through the ranks of the Republican Party, but that's the guy who won. The message I'm taking is that the people are fed up and the parties are not responding to what the people want. And if the people have an opportunity to speak effectively, then they will boot out the party preferences. And that goes to what I was talking about, which is the diminishing party registration in our state, like in most states. The parties have either got to evolve and start to be responsive to the people they claim they're representing, or we're going to see a, a continual struggle between the desire of the parties to maintain absolute control, because if they let any control go, their party, their power loosens because they're not responsive. And that's the tug of war I see right now. And that's the story that I see playing out in CD9, that there was a way to get beyond the party predetermination and allow the people to speak. It's the biggest problem we have in our special elections, is that they aren't open and the people don't get to choose the candidates. And as a consequence, we get very pedestrian, uninteresting candidates. Susan, I'm going to have to leave to visit with some students, but just to relieve your fears about the state senate, we're not going to worry because Staten Island's representative, Lanza, was the left fielder on my Bay Group League team, and I'll talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, don't forget Diane Thank Savino, you. the Democrat as well as the Republican. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for, we're ready for the next question, but before he is recognized, I'd like to introduce to you someone who is new to the Wagner scene, somebody who left the beautiful city of Atlanta, Georgia, to come to New York City. In Atlanta, she was the deputy provost of Spelman College, one of the outstanding colleges in the country. And here she is our new provost. And I wish you luck, Lily, in your new position and under the great leadership of President Richard Garassi. I'm sure that Wagner will do very, very well in the future. Welcome to our for your first lecture at the Cary Institute. Yes, sir, you had a question. Uh, I, I don't want you to take offense to this. Uh, Name, please. Go oh, for my it. My name is Danny Panzella. I'm a visitor. And if you're asking a question that she might take offense, we need your name. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to make a statement about uh, the ahead. fact that the parties are controlled not only by the corporate interests that control the parties, but by the attorneys for the most part. It's, I believe, legislators, 80% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. attorneys that subjugate themselves to those corporate interests. So rather than, than a con con, for real reform, wouldn't a, a real grassroots effort to replace the legislature in entirety with true grassroots, uh, let, the, rep, let the people represent themselves rather than this new priest class that has arisen this uh, lawyer slash investment 
Wall Street all the right. time. Right. Well, I, a couple of a couple of thoughts in response to that. One, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Okay. Um, the truth of the matter is, is what we've seen. A couple of things. One, our campaign finance system makes it extremely hard. Again, it's the way in which the entrenched powers stay entrenched. Um, make it extremely hard to uh, have a true populist movement rise up because of the amount of money that's needed to run. Um, second, the special elections are used to try and nip that in the bud because we have fewer open seats than many other places. We have a huge incumbency return rate here. And what we see very frequently is exactly what we saw in the seats that were just filled through a special election. We, they were open as a result of factors like an older legislator who waited until six months after her reelection to decide to resign so that her replacement could be handpicked. Um, three of the seats were open because legislators were appointed uh, to other state office. And that, by the way, the, the most frequent way in which seats open in New York's legislature are death or another job, not through the election process. And the special elections are jiggered to ensure that they're handpicked by parties. So I, I think we definitely need a strong grassroots movement, but it's going to take us a while to overcome some of the systemic impediments. And I think we need to be double tracking because that question is going to be on the ballot. And if we could use it to open up the process, then we would be able to change the people in the legislature more readily. Okay, uh, we have uh, several hands raised now, but I promised Susan Lerner that she could get the 610 van to get her to the ferry on time. She has another commitment for tonight. I want to thank her for an outstanding presentation. And I also want to say that this is the basis of the Cary Institute's next monograph with the cooperation of Susan Learn. Thank you. Thank you. Before, before you list one quick, one quick thing I'd like to, to tell the students. If these students and their friends and others would like to get involved yes. beyond just receiving a newsletter, nonpartisan, absent apart, all that sort of stuff we've been talking about, just give them one or two things they could be doing right now that could get started in terms of organizing or participating in something. Totally. Next Thursday, the legislative task force which is charged with drawing the new political district lines, is holding a public hearing here in Staten Island. Don't ask me exactly where. 10 o'clock Thursday morning. And it's an opportunity to hear what your neighbors have to say or to say to them, we don't like the way you've drawn the lines in Staten Island or we think that next time you could do better. We do or we don't. And don't like being uh, hooked up with this part of Brooklyn and the truth of the matter is that you don't have enough people to have two entire congressional districts here or two entire Senate seats that are solely Staten Island so you're going to have to hook up uh, with some other part of the city which part of the city do you think you should be linked with um, I've heard people in the North Shore complain that the section of the North Shore is not deep enough to have enough political power. The way the line is drawn, it's way too close to the shore. It's about four blocks. That's not enough for people to really feel like they have enough uh, investment uh, to participate. So you live it here. The People who draw the lines can't know every single area of the state. They need to hear from you. We're drawing our own reform map. We need to hear from Staten Islanders. What makes sense to you? Do you like where the lines are now? Do you think they should be changed? That's an opportunity to go and be heard um, and to hear what other people are, uh, are saying. 
Um, and this process is going to have other opportunities uh, for public input. Um, and it's a big one, redistricting. Susan has to catch this uh, van, yes, yes, but yes. Alexa has another assignment. If you're interested in being present at the hearing next Thursday relating to redistricting and Staten Island, let Alexa Marin know. And she will email to you the location and the place for this meeting. Thank you all very, very much.